Hello, I'm Tom Meissner. In 2008, I founded Pipeline Knowledge and Development as a mechanism to share my experience and knowledge about the industry with the many oil and gas pipeline stakeholders. So I make short uh, tutorials about oil and gas pipelines and related facilities, and I'm glad to hear people are using them. I get emails from time to time with more questions. Here's a email excerpt from an email that I received in uh, late January. So here's a guy who is working on uh, AST, above ground storage tanks terminals. He's got some questions. He works for an EPC company and uh, obviously he's a discipline engineer with not a lot of background on facilities and wants to learn more. But he wants to say, he wants to know what is the roof landing? What happens when a roof is at its lowest? And he says, our client often mentions in their design reviews, they don't want roof landings. So why, why, why don't they want roof landings? Why is that not so desirable? What's the critical zone in the floating roof tanks? And if the tank can raise or lower itself on top of the oil surface, then why vacuum breakers are still required in the roof? And so there are a couple things that he needs to know. And he asked me to respond to that. And rather than just sending him a response, I thought it would make a tu tutorial so he can watch and you can watch as well and hopefully benefit. These slides are from my equipment and components uh, class that I teach. You can see this is slide 55. So before we answer his questions, let's talk a little bit about roofs and specifically floating roofs. So I've got a couple little drawings here. And if you look at the one on the left, what I've attempted to draw is a tank with liquid. And then if there's nothing to keep the, the liquid from vaporizing, it's going to vaporize and fill up this empty space, if you will, between the surface and the roof. And as the liquid goes up and down, more vapor is going to be generated or vapor is going to be displaced out the top. So if you imagine the, uh, if the surface is down a ways and we're filling the tank, then all this vapor that's above the surface gets displaced out to the atmosphere. If we begin to empty the tank, the surface comes down, more air gets drawn into the tank, and then more and more of the liquid vaporizes. So the reason we put roofs on tanks is to control vapor. So you can see that the on the right-hand side, I have the similar drawing, but I put a roof on it, and now it says less vapor. So whenever we're filling this tank, there's less vapor to be displaced as it goes, as the liquid comes up. So if you imagine this roof floating up and down, we don't want the roof to sink all the way to the bottom, right? Because we'd have problems with getting it filled again. So the roof is on legs that keep it from going all the way down to the bottom. So let's take uh, another look at another slide here. So here's a picture there, this picture of some oil tanks. And so you can see the one on the left that says external floating roof EFR. There's a roof there that floats up and down on the fluids. And then the one on the right that says cone roof with internal floating roof IFR. This was a tank that was built a number of years ago before floating roofs were required. So about the 1980s in the U.S., we began to require floating roofs on uh, products or liquids that had were above a certain vapor pressure as a way to control the uh, discharge into the environment. So you can see the cone roof tank with an internal floating roof. If you look towards the top, there are little vents there. And so the vapor is pushed out and it comes back again as we're going along. So external floating roof and internal floating roof and not all cone roof tanks have internal floating roofs. It depends on the vapor pressure. So now here is a little closer view of an external floating roof. You can see I've pointed out a couple things there. Since the roof is open on top, the shell is open on top, we put a horizontal piece of steel around there to stiffen it up so when the wind blows, it won't induce vibration into the top of this tank, uh, VIV, vortex-induced vibration, and make it basically shake and uh, cause operating problems and potentially fatigue. And you can see then, I also pointed out, there's a stair and a, and a gauge tube there. So the gauge tube goes down into the tank. That's how we know how much fluid is in the tank by where it is, that gauge tube, or a uh, 
tank gauge on the side or a radar gauge on the top. So whenever these tanks are built, somebody climbs all over them with a tape measure and measures them and produces tank tables that tell us for at each specific height in the tank the volumes in the tank. So now you're beginning to think about this floating roof going up and down and when it first lands on its feet the fluid is basically uh, pressed up on the side between the roof and the tank a certain amount caused by the displacement of the weight of the roof when it first lands. As we continue to draw out from the underneath the tank you can imagine that this liquid that's just around the surface goes down very quickly because there's very little volume there. It's just spread around the outside. So that's the critical zone. We have to be very careful when we're measuring there to make sure we don't make a measurement mistake. So since we're looking at this, let's just look at roofs a little bit more. You can see here the tank stairs going up. You can on the left and you can see on the right we have the platform there. If you look kind of back behind the platform, you can see the gauge tube and then a ladder going down into the roof. If we go on the side of the tank, we can see this happens to be a crude oil tank. We've got a mixer there to keep everything mixed up. Sometimes products tanks have mixers as well to make sure the product stays blended. And on the left, you can see we have a reading level. So that's 20 feet and nine or eight, eight some inches. And we have a transmitter that will transmit that information to some sort of a control room so they know how much is in the tank. So if we're on that ladder, we look down into the roof. You can see here is the steel roof and it's floating on crude oil in this case. It could just as well be refined products. And you see those uh, things sticking up. Those are legs that are sticking up. Here's a drawing then that expands upon the concept of legs and gives a few more details about roofs. So if you look at the right, you can see I've got the legs shown in two different positions, low legs or high legs. And legs are just a piece of pipe, basically. There's a hole cut in the roof, and there's a sleeve on the hole to keep the uh, liquid from running out through the hole. And then the pipe goes through the sleeve, and the pipe has a uh, pad, a piece of metal, welded to it to help distribute the weight on the bottom of the tank. So typically, in normal operations, these legs will be in a low position, so they will keep the roof off of the floor and uh, a bit above it. And then whenever we want to get in and work on the tank, we may need to put it on high legs. So there's a, a pin or a, a piece of metal that goes through the leg and through the sleeve to hold it in a position. And whenever we want to uh, drop the legs to a lower level, we pull this pin out. We drop the leg down and then shove it in into the place where it's been, uh, the hole's been drilled in through the sleeve and in through the leg to be able to uh, hold it on either high legs or low legs. So if we look on the left then, we can see a few more details. We can see the tank shell and then we see the floor down at the bottom. They're welded together there, obviously, and the place where they're welded together is typically called the chime. And then we built this tank on a tank pad, a pad of sand to distribute the weight. Sometimes, depending upon the soil, we may put a concrete ring wall around the whole thing uh, right underneath the uh, tank shell because that's where most of the weight's going to be, the weight of the steel, obviously, pressing down. So if we look at this drawing for some more detail, we can see there's a pontoon, which is helping to provide flotation. Then between the pontoon and the tank shell, little area that says seal area. I haven't drawn in the seals there. You can't see them, but obviously we don't leave that space open. We'll put sealing material in there. And then you can see we've got the leg, uh, the roof deck, and then a roof drain. We put in a roof drain because if it rains, we need to drain the water off the roof. And I haven't shown the pipe or the hose coming out of the roof drain, but you can certainly imagine that there's got to be a, a pipe or hose coming out of that roof drain to be able to drain the material off the roof. Dropping down and looking at a close-up then, landing the roof. So let's talk about the left first. Whenever we uh, draw the, the liquid out, at some point this roof lands. The landing, of course, is when the uh, feet touch the floor and then they hold the tank roof, the floating roof of the tank, from going any lower. 
when we continue to pull liquid out, there is vapor formed. So we need to make sure that we allow some uh, uh, atmosphere to come in so we don't cause any problems with that vapor forming and uh, suck in the roof, for example, so vacuum breaks. If the vapor never formed, we would never have to have vacuum breaks. But obviously, you can imagine when we're going to fill this back up again, we're going to have something to let that vapor escape. So the reason we don't want to land completely the roof very often, is fine if we land it. But if we then pull uh, vapor or pull liquid out from the bottom, it causes us problems. And when we fill it back up again, the additional vapor is displaced, uh, potentially in violation of our air permits. So that's a little bit about landing the roof. Now, if you look then at the right, we can see what I've labeled the critical zones. If you remember, we know how much fluid is in the tank by the level of the, fl the fluid that's floating right, right there. So as the material, or as the roof is coming down, floating before it lands, the amount of material or fluid pushed up into that critical zone is exactly the same regardless of where the roof is, as long as it's floating. The, roof of the, the weight of the roof is the same, so it pushes the same amount up in there, and we know that whenever we're doing our measurement. When we land, and as the liquid begins to first be pulled out from underneath the roof, this liquid, this column of liquid all around the tank in this critical zone falls very quickly. So we have to make sure we know that in our measurement because we're measuring the total height and if that changes more quickly than we would normally expect, it can cause us to think we've got a loss that happened during that period of time. Happened to be one time that one of my guys was uh, draining out or emptying, transferring from tank to tank, and he thought that he had some theft because of we were just landing and we were going through this critical zone, and he thought he didn't have as much fluid as he actually had. So now we can take another look. Here is a geodesic dome. The floating roof, the external floating roof, the tank top is open, and so if it rains, water can blow in and run down the side or, and get into the tank. So in the old days, we used to drain this water out of the tank, basically into the inside of the uh, dike around the tank. We don't do that anymore, uh, so it became more expensive to get rid of water, which then gave us economics to put domes on the tank. So geodesic domes, or you can see the stairs, that's an old kind of stairs. We don't build that kind anymore. We wrap them around the tank. There's the shell of the tank. So a geodesic dome, and we started putting those on probably in the 1980s sometime. Pretty nice also in uh, places where we have a lot of snow to be able to keep the snow out. So that's a little tutorial about uh, parts of the tank. I hope you've enjoyed that. And if you want to uh, look at more tutorials, please go to PipelineKnowledge.com and click on videos, and there will be a list of them. Hope that I might see some of you in one of my training classes one day.